So, time to do WWDC analysis. So, we're going to look through some of the announcements. So, Tim has kind of covered uh, some of the stuff in his thing, and I have some other stuff that I'm going to point out, and we'll have a discussion. Um, and I have a lot of questions as well that we can kind of uh, go over. So, kind of our goals with this analysis is to sort of understand what are some of the trends in our industry that are driving some of these decisions, and also, you know, become aware of the different tools that Apple's announcing. It gives us the ability to be creative, to think about new, you know, product concepts, that type of thing. A lot of the people who come to the iOS meetup are more like independent uh, developers and people, so I think this, uh, you know, helps all of us to come up with um, interesting ideas and implications of the things that were announced. So, one of the first trends I want to talk about is privacy and security. So, before we look at Apple's um, announcements, uh, first question I have is, who here is using a password manager? So a lot of people, a, a large percentage of people are using ones. And like, if your friend is going to ask you about passwords, like maybe if you have more like, a lot of people here are probably more like technical users, but like friends that you have who aren't technical users, what types of things do you usually tell them about passwords and about security for their devices? Go for it. Yes. If you can, try to use a two-step two uh, authentication. Uh -huh. So two-factor two authentication yeah. is one thing. Uh -huh. That would be my best advice. Anything else? What do you usually advise? I mean, I'm trying to get my parents to use password management. They're like, no, it's fine. <laughs> I just write it all down this notebook. It's safe. I'm like, please. <laughs> Yes, that is what a lot of people are doing. Hey, at least they're not using the same password in every single site, I guess, if they're ready to in a notebook. Yeah, post it's on the monitor. Any, anyone else, things like advice you usually give or? Yeah, your friend asked you. I mean, would you recommend a password manager? Which one would you recommend? I would say definitely use one like I think one password is by far the best. Uh -huh. I'd definitely say, um, given the reason, like, like the thing, the thing that really woke me up was once a friend actually said, "Hey, is your password this?" So I was like, "How the hell do you know my password?" He's like, "Because a, a database just leaks and your password, your email isn't there, so I looked up your password isn't there too." I was like, "Oh my god, okay." So, um, yeah, no. Sites get compromised all the time, so right. Yeah, and once that actually happens to you, that's like a real wake up call. So um, now it's like a, to everyone I recommend it because they have to be. Mm -hmm. It's probably happened to everybody at some point, I think. So it's maybe, maybe your friend hasn't like called you up and told you your password. Yeah, but. Do, your password this. I think that, that's yeah. All right, and how about as developers? Like when you are developing your own types of tools, what are the types of things that you are doing to protect your users' security? Keychain. Keychain? So you're using, so you're saving the passwords for your app in the keychain? Encryption. Uh, what types of like where do you what do you encrypt and? Um, I don't know anything about my company my company's uh, policies, but my own stuff um, I use Rob a lot, and Rob has built-in encryption. So the idea is you can very easily protect all your users' data by uh, encrypting the database on disk and then storing the encryption key in the future. Okay. Yeah. So and I guess a lot of services now do have a tool, so you don't actually have to implement the encryption yourself. You can yeah. use a tool that is doing it. Anyone else? What are things you do when you're trying to secure your applications? TLS. T TLS. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have to use that one. So, like, you're using HTTPS for your um, for when you have website access. Apple's really pushing you very strongly to do that now in a lot of apps. So. Uh huh. Actually, instead of uh, using username and passwords, uh, I try to use old. Get the tokens through like third parties 
Uh huh. So, so your service doesn't even really deal with passwords at all, which yeah. is nice because then you don't have to worry about storing them. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, make sure you have you know, the necessary measures for the server. Uh huh. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, when you do, so yeah, you have a password entry. Um, one of the easiest ways, if it's if it, if a malicious user can very very quickly enter a lot of passwords, then that creates a security problem. So you want to delay the amount of time it takes for people to enter in new things. Yeah. Anything else people are using? Steps you take to secure your applications? Mm hmm. The what? Uh, I guess uh, I said me again. So oh, no problem. Everyone is free. This is a discussion oriented group. So, anyone free to just chime in anytime? Alright. So, I guess yeah, you, you heard about the GDPR uh, in Europe. Uh huh. So, uh, regarding <coughs> privacy, for example, we, in the app I'm, I'm working on, we, we try to match GDPR rules. And now, one, one of the main things that we have to do is to allow. Uh, the user to remove all his data from our platform if he wants to. So I think this is a pretty big step uh, right now that all, all apps should propose. Actually, there is another functionality that is uh, mandatory. It's uh, a way for the user to, to retrieve and, and be able to check the data that your company owns on them. Mm -hmm. so this is pretty tricky because you don't want to use information. Right. Yeah, that's true. So especially if you're doing any type of, if your business in any way pretty much interacts with European customers, you have to care about these things. So that means stuff like um, you have to have the ability to delete account and the user should know all of the data that you have that you're storing about them and have some way to retrieve that. So those are considerations you'll need to be making now for your service. Um, if you're dealing with credit cards, I think this is now legally mandatory in Japan, but Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's a lot of legal issues surrounding storing credit card numbers. In our case, we use Stripe so that we don't have to. But um, <laughs> the vast majority of people use third-party services. Yeah, I think that's probably that if you don't have to store, you know, don't put yourself in a position where you need to store credit card numbers is the easiest way to be compliant. Um, maybe if you're building like a payment system or something, you might have no choice. But yeah. Those are always good to avoid storing any kind of you know sensitive data. Cool. Well, let's um, let's look at some of the things we've, we've kind of brought up some of these issues already. But um, so Apple also did and had a kind of segment in some of their things about what steps they're taking for privacy and security. And I do think that this is a an important trend in the industry right now. Um, people are recognizing that while passwords have been a very standard way to protect people's information, and a lot of accounts have passwords, and if you're building a service, you may have passwords. Passwords are, in a lot of ways, a pretty flawed way to um, guarantee that somebody is, um, that, 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 to guarantee security. The reason for that being is that passwords are usually really hard to remember, and people's memories are that good, and also because there's so many more websites, and each one of them has a password, you have this problem of either their users can't really remember 100 different passwords, so they reuse passwords, but then websites get hacked, so then that password is, you know, that they got in this website was revealed because this website got hacked, but that means that somebody can look them up and then log into their account in this password, that type of thing. So in terms of, um, Dealing with passwords, there are a lot of flaws, basically, um, that are kind of being exposed. And one famous site I put at the bottom here, "Have I Been Owned?" is the "Have I Been Owned?" Is the uh, one repository where you can look up like I don't know a billion passwords that have been compromised on all the various sites and things like that. So um, things like that. So this is a, a pretty big problem that has been happening. 
and so Apple actually has done a couple different things relating to um, relating to this issue. So one of the things is that Apple will allow automatic strong passwords to be generated. So they'll just like create a password automatically that would be like unique to your app or something. But you can just generate and automatic, automatically create a password that would be strong and unique. Um, and they'll also allow that password to be like automatically filled in. So it's like one of the problems with strong passwords that are like A137, dollar sign, whatever, that goes on for like 30 characters. That's a good password, but you can't remember it. So we have to kind of rely on the technology that's there. And like your iPhone and the ecosystem will be the thing that remembers the password for you because there's this tension between passwords that are good and human memory, basically. Um, so you can, it'll automatically generate passwords, it'll fill them in for you in your app so the user doesn't have to type a really long string of random characters. Um, they'll also do stuff like if you have two-factor authentication, they, and so that means that you'll get like a message from iMessage with like a number. Your two-factor is usually like, you have a password, and then it also is um, somehow connected to your phone, so it'll send you like a, uh, maybe like a message in iMessage or an email or something. So it can actually like pull out that, um, that pin code that you'd be sent via message and fill that in, or put that in the keyboard so it'll automatically fill it in. So they're doing a lot of things to make that type of security, those like what are becoming the state of the art measures, more um, accessible for people, basically, like really easy, not like it's a pain to deal with it, but very simple and quick to get these more like state of the art security. Um, and if you are interested and in have any of the, uh, like if you're building like a password tool yourself or something, they've also added a new API authentication services that you can um, look at and use. Um, one of the things to realize is that Apple is also really trying to push themselves as like the tech company that cares about people's privacy as a way to differentiate themselves from some of their competitors like Google and Facebook. So for them as well, this is like a pretty um, important part of the identity that they're building around the brand, and I think that really shows through in the way that they uh, that they do a lot of these things. Cool. I think that's it. Yeah, that's it for privacy and security. Any other questions or comments before we leave this topic? During the talk show on Tuesday, John said directly to to um, John, "Like you guys care about security before it was cool, right?" <laughs> Everyone laughs and said, and Apple was like, yes, we care very much about it because we don't, you know, we believe everyone should have to control their own data. Mm -hmm. Because they have something to hide. It's a very important thing. Yeah. Cool. And we had one hand with that too? Yeah. Oh, no, wrong. Uh, sorry. Uh, no, it's okay. You didn't mention biometrics and the uh, face uh -huh. recognition and uh, fingerprints. Yes, that's true. to be very big. That's true. Apple is definitely, they, they're, um, Moving forward, a lot of those things like Face ID came with the iOS 10 or iPhone 10, and um, yeah, before that they had the fingerprint scanner. So you're right, Apple is also making privacy more convenient or security more convenient through biometric things rather than memorizing passwords. Any other thoughts, comments on this? relating to tooling and changes to tooling and things like that. So I'm gonna go over that, we'll be on this for, for quite a while. Let's start with instruments. Did anybody, um, is it, does anybody use instruments regularly? Yes. What are some of your favorite tools? And if you're using instruments, what are you commonly firing up? Foreign Invasion Profile. 
or animation profiler. Memory. And, and you know, memory. Memory. Yeah, memory. memory. Anyone else? Your favorite instruments? They've already been. Memory is mine. Just so that we clear. <laughs> So there were a couple of improvements to instruments. Uh, some of these were interesting. So one is the new, there's an OS signpost, which I think is supposed to be used similar to how you are using printf, or not really, I don't use printf, I use print, but you know, same, effectively that, that style of you know, logging something. Um, so they are recommending, I think, that you would use this OS signpost instead, because you can have more tooling related features associated with it in your code. The second thing that was kind of interesting was the ability to create your own custom instrument. So that's a new feature. I don't think that was possible before. But if you want to have your own type profiler that's specific to your app, you can use, um, you can develop that and use it. They had an example of, I think, doing some type of network requests um, profiler that somebody had made as one of the demos that they gave of that. Yes, that was it for instruments. Anybody have any else? Anything else they liked from instruments? Was there a session to actually show how to create a custom tool? I, I only saw that they brought in a custom video, but I didn't find a thing in the video. In the videos? I actually don't know. Was there? Well, they, they touched it in the state of the union, but um, I'm sure there's actually a talk dedicated to it, but I'm not sure. You kind of hope that there would be, because. Yeah, um, but yeah, actually, I don't know. I didn't see specifically a video to that. So there's a session number four one zero. Four one zero. Title is creating custom instruments. So there's a debug, but I haven't watched it. Okay, four one zero. Nobody's watched it yet, so <laughs> you can watch it and then tell us about it at the next iOS event. <laughs> All right. Um, how about source editing? So. I spend a lot of my time in Xcode, but I also do some like web and other things. So I'm also using some other editors, like uh, I use Visual Studio Code a lot, that type of thing. Is anyone here regularly using editors other than Xcode? One, two, three, four, a bunch. What other editors do you use? And like, do they have any features that you really like that you wish were in Xcode? Yes, <laughs> multi cursor is one. Which editor? Sublime. Sublime. Sublime has the best multi cursor, I think, in my opinion. Require rectangular selection. Which one? Rectangular selection. Rectangular selection. Is that when you like the column editing? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The next one gets also done. Yeah. yeah it's good. No spoilers, but. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else that you are using in your editors that you want to have? Code folding. Code folding. Vim Emacs divided. Yes, I want Vim, and they did not announce that, so. Uh, plugins, plugins. Plugins, uh huh. Used to have it. Yes, they, they did used to have. Their X Vim like, exists or something. It's very extensions. It's very hacky. Yeah, that was the thing, was I used it, but it kept crashing, so I could never do it. But I would love to have them key bindings in Xcode. Cool, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yes. Actually, that one is coming, so. <laughs> so, uh, we'll move on then. So, there was, we're, and a lot of people doing development outside of Xcode, I think, know that like text editors are kind of moving forward, and Xcode hasn't necessarily gotten all the latest features or conveniences that some of the other newer editors are having. And uh, but a lot of them are coming to uh, to Xcode 10, so they spend a lot of time uh, building out a newer, I guess, more modern text editor. One thing they talked about was like the speed speed improvements and things improving to source kits, so, like the the highlighting, which has been occasionally terrible in Swift, um, 
is uh, hopefully going to be better, but also things like better uh, code completion and better navigation. So like if you're in one part of the code and you want to see like, okay, what, what is this calling or also what calls it, you can like navigate to points in your code. Um, it has, uh, let's see, code folding, multi-cursor, and also better Git support are all things that are going to be included, and more integration with services. They already had GitHub integration, now they're adding GitLab and Bitbucket, so um, yeah, some great features there if you are missing those when you are in Xcode like I do, but no Kim, Kim keystrokes yet. Xcode 11, I hope. Cool, and also refactoring. They are improving a lot of the Swift refactoring stuff. Um, and they're using the new build system. So, cool, those are improvements to Xcode. Anybody, um, anybody have anything else Xcode related before we move on? Uh, apparently, it's the old, there was a new build system announced last year that's now becoming a default. They changed the build system so that it's faster and uses less memory and is written in Swift. Um, I'm not sure where the setting is for it. It was, it was a, an option. I've never turned it on, but there's, a, there's an option where you can turn it on somewhere in Xcode. Like, um, but it was like a experimental last year and now is the the one that they're, um, they're, they're making by default. They are adding the compilation mode also to reduce the size of the binary you can generate. You lose a little bit of, of speed uh, during the, the, the execution, but your binary can be smaller. Okay. I think this is for targeting like embedded devices or something like that. Ah, okay. So also, another build setting that will make the binary smaller? Yeah. Cool. Like, uh, my is or something like that. Uh-huh. like, That's cool. Anything else? We'll move on to LLDB. So how many people use LLDB regularly? <coughs> I use it, but mostly just to do print object. <laughs> Is that a debugger? There, are, I know of uh, some other things that are really cool and would probably help me to find problems more quickly. I just forget. I usually like find them one time and then I forget about them or something. So there's a lot out there. But uh, anyone using anything cool in in LLDB? Yes. Yeah, the constraint uh, checker. Uh... Breakpoint. You can add a symbol breakpoint uh -huh. so that the uh, Xcode just stops uh, when you have a constraint that breaks. Uh -huh. So yeah, I, I don't remember the name of the symbol, uh, the symbol, but I think it's UIU constraint. So okay. Uh, it's just really convenient when you have a potential. Uh, like, for example, if you write your UI by code, it can happen a lot. If you're using a interface builder, well, uh, it checks it checks your your uh, auto layout constraints. But if you do it by code, you you might want to use that. Yeah. Okay, I've heard about that. Yeah, it's like yeah. Uh, something hits the debugger when the constraint when there's a problem with your auto layout. I think I've heard about that one. Yeah. Uh, I always use for like a UI debugging. I mean like. A uh, checking the recursive description, uh -huh. like ADS of it, and then after that you get the pointer of that and uh, the address of that view, and then you target that and you draw like a border color and like nudge stuff, you know, with using the title, basic title, uh -huh. you get to do something like that uh, stuff, so it's very helpful for the writing. Yes. I've heard about that. So that, that Facebook library is still, title. still works. What was the name of the library? Chisel. Chisel? Yeah. Oh, Chisel. Yeah, it's Chisel. Is that it? Yeah, yeah. Well, I tracked that a couple years ago. Yeah, it still works. It still works, okay. It's like a library where like, you can actually, like in the debugger, move the view around. So it would be like you could get a handle on like a view, and then in the debugger actually like reposition it and stuff like that. Yeah, that's right. 
Facebook chisel. Cool. Uh -huh. What is the, the name of the tool uh, debug the views on so, uh, when you when you set a breakpoint when you stop the app you can uh, you can see the view hierarchy right within within uh, uh, Xcode. It's like reveal, like reveal my app. Yeah, yes. reveal, yeah. Reveal is an app that did it before yeah, yeah, yeah. before Xcode Sherlock's that feature. Yeah, yeah. But this is, is this is still good to have a reveal. I think it's a bit uh, faster, smoother. Yeah, I've yeah, heard. So it's, a good, it's a good advice to give to developers to use, to use this app. Yeah, I've heard reveal is still quite a bit faster and better than the. But there, so you can do like in Xcode like a view debugger, but reveal app is still better than than the, than the yeah. Xcode yeah. version. They, they just added support for CA layers that you won't use, which is really helpful. Well, yeah, that's pretty cool. Who needs UI kit anymore? Just write it directly for animation. <laughs> All right. So, LLDB. So, some stuff that they're adding, if you're doing this, is uh, better access to variables and improvements to the um, downloading of debugger symbols. So, I guess you, you can actually download those from. App Store Connect, I guess now, <laughs> and uh, so like that was took a long time. They really improved that. So like if there's issues and things that um, improving the time that you can get feedback, and they also added the ability to see reports for energy issues, not just like if your app crashes, but if your app is using a lot of energy, and that's something that you want to debug. You can look at that. So all right, and testing improvements. Um, some other changes, I guess, who here is using a lot of the testing? I didn't ask that question. XC test mostly, or do you use another framework for it? Quick. Use quick? Yeah. Uh-huh. Anyone else doing testing, and what, what are you doing with it? Like what framework, XC test, or whatever? I, I just gave up on quick recently because I finally kept making X for crash. Oh, okay. I still use XC tests most of the time, so I haven't tried Quick in a while. So, cool. Um, so, actually, testing is something that Apple's been, I think, criticized for a little bit because they always seem like they're behind the industry. Like, uh, testing and test driven development has become kind of a big trend, and Xcode's tooling support and stuff has always been like sort of there, but not great. So, they're working a lot. This year on testing things, uh, one of the things that they are improving is code coverage, which apparently is already out, like they already did that. Um, they're also now allowing you to randomize the order of tests and execute tests in parallel, which is cool. Um, this was one of my favorite things from the platform State of the Union was they were showing, these are like doing UI tests right now, in a, like eight, or, sorry, 10 simulators simultaneously. So it like massively cut down the amount of time it took to run all the UI tests. I thought that was pretty cool. So um, yeah, <coughs> I'm looking forward to these improvements when I can run all of my UI tests at the same time. And also, uh, in Swift Playgrounds, they're going to have new people-like interactions. So hopefully that makes Playgrounds better, because I love Playgrounds but I seriously cannot write that much code before it starts to become not usable. Like, just, it hangs forever, like I'm writing some code, and maybe there's problems with my code, but rather than showing me what the problem is, it just hangs indefinitely until I close it and reopen it, and then the error shows up, or other type of things. So it's a really cool concept, but hopefully they have some, uh, you know, hopefully it'll work better, basically. So, we'll see. Anyone else like playgrounds and use them a lot? Sometimes. I don't like it. You don't like it? <laughs> it's, it's too unstable, but, but uh -huh. it's good for throwing together a view, and then once it gets too crashy, I just make a really simple sample app that's just like one view controller. Yeah. yeah. Really transition. That's exactly what I do. I like probably like start with the playground and write about 15 lines of code, and then it's no longer usable, and I'm just like, well, time to make a full app to do this, right? So, cool. All right. So, 
one of the things that I noticed, at least um, thinking about tooling in general as a topic, was that there was a lot of time spent, especially on the developer talks, relating to a lot of the tooling changes and improvements and things like that. Um, another thing that I noticed was that all the time they kept talking about how faster everything was. Like that was, I think, literally the first thing they said in the keynote was that everything is now faster. Like iOS 12 is going to be faster and all of that. They kept um, really stressing this point that, like in iOS and Mac OS and things like that, everything is now faster. So my impression is that really Apple's been on this uh, cycle of trying to improve things. Um, so I guess they've been improving their tooling, and probably by merit of improving their tooling, they've also been able to improve their own software a lot. That was kind of the picture that I had relating to sort of what has been going on in Apple in the past year or so. I think this is really interesting because, for example, they spent a lot of time on tooling, and there is virtually nothing new in UIKit this year. So that's kind of an uh, interesting change because usually the most important and impactful things that I spend the most time thinking about for the year is going to be like, okay, what new thing did they do in UIKit? For example, last year the big thing was um, drag and drop on the iPad was a major change that they were sort of stressing as like a user experience development. And this year, there's not really anything like that, like no new like user experience interaction type thing, not like 3D touch or whatever that they have done in previous years. So um, it really seems like this was a year that they spent focusing a lot on just making the process of developing software better and making those types of improvements. Any other thoughts relating to tooling and stuff before we move on? All right, let's talk briefly about Swift. Swift is not that exciting to talk about because it's an open source project with a roadmap, so we already kind of know everything of importance. Um, Swift 4.2 is coming out. The thing that I'm most excited about right now are the hashable improvements because I was trying to write a bunch of hashable hash values for some structs and it was still really annoying, so it's like, can't wait for that to come out. Um, and I think for Swift 5, they keep talking about ABI stability, and hopefully this will finally be the thing that we get from Swift 5, so that um, the, the biggest implication of this is then Swift can be bundled with iOS, so that rather than when I build my Swift app, it includes Swift with my binary, making it really big, it will just be part of the operating system, and the size of everybody's apps can get a lot smaller. So uh, that's one of the implications for that. Do you know a little bit about the uh, variable ownership system? About the variable ownership system? I've heard about that as a topic, but I do. You, can you say no, more? Uh, I don't. I don't know exactly. Uh, I just know. Uh, uh, I just did a little bit of Rust. Uh huh. So maybe there's a totally different meaning in Rust and Swift five, but I don't know exactly. I was hoping you could enlighten us on that topic. I unfortunately cannot. Does anybody know anything more? I, I have heard such a thing that the Swift team is looking at, because Rust is a programming language similar to Swift that is, um, has kind of similar goals, but they have some unique approaches to how they're doing memory management, where Swift is a lot more simple. It's, it's art, basically, and that's what it is. Um, for Rust, they have more like, I think different names. You've done it, and I have not programmed Rust, but it's like, you you basically can tag pointers as different things, and then that controls how the memory will be managed for that object, right? But basically, if you create a variable, and you give the variable to a function, then you cannot do anything with this variable anymore, uh -huh. because it's owned by the function, and it disappears there. So you need to rethink your code, and like, I still better the memory management you know, mm -hmm. things like that. Uh, I know that they do something in Swift. It's the way they, they free the memory. Like in the new version of Swift, the, the reference count and everything is managed by the function. For example, if you give the variable to a function, 
uh -huh. the function is in charge of uh, releasing the file from the memory. That it would, it's the case right now. Okay. But in the new version, uh, the, 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 the root function where you declare the variable will be in charge of releasing this variable. So I don't know exactly the mechanism behind it, mm -hmm. but uh, this is a big change uh, in the new version of Swift. I don't think it's Swift 5, it's more uh -huh. uh, So I don't know if I'm clear enough, but uh, the, the same function, if you declare a variable, this variable should be uh, released by the same function and not the sub function where you give the value to another function. It's not related, it should, it should not be in charge of releasing this variable anymore. Okay, so they sort of changed how the ownership model works in yes, R a little yes. bit. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's okay. Really, there's already uh, improvement. Okay. So, uh, yeah, if you call the function, that function is kind of response. I mean, before that, the uh, system compiler is trying to retain the variable. Exactly. Yeah, but now it's, it's all gone. And it's, I think it's called like a guarantee uh, convention or something like that. Okay. So I'm not sure, sure about comparing to Rust, but uh, I think that's one part of the improvement of memory like management, or I mean ownership management. But the, I think last time I can move on with semantics and uh, share uh, point of passing to the argument so that you don't have to like, retain stuff. And I think that's another goal in Swift, uh, I and especially. And I, as far as I see that like, the forum, uh, I think it's still ongoing. I mean, I'm not sure if that will be implemented, I mean, ready to be implemented, but uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's cool, yeah. So I, I did hear uh, that that was like a on the roadmap basically, but I wasn't sure. Actually, I didn't really look in detail at that topic, so that's good to know. So Swift will still be improved, uh, changing the memory management model and hopefully making it better. And Swift and Rust have a lot of similar types of goals, so I think it makes sense that Swift might take some of the better ideas from Rust. So, cool. All right. Um, is anybody doing anything with metal? Yes, that there is a sense in which we are all doing things with metal. Um, this was, I think, kind of interesting because Apple also spent a pretty sizable time talking about the improvements to metal, even though, Practically speaking, probably not very many engineers are using metal in their everyday thing, although we all benefit from it because metal is sort of like the foundational layer and then above metal is core animation, UI kit, like a whole lot of different things. Also the machine learning stuff that they're working on is probably is based on that because um, metal is basically how they communicate with the GPU and how you can you know best utilize it's the language that um, Apple is developing to work with the GPU hardware, so pretty much anything that uses the GPU is based on it. Um, that's why I kind of, even though they spend a while on it in various ways, I kind of condensed all of this into one slide because practically speaking, most of us are not really writing metal and probably won't be writing metal directly unless you are doing some pretty specific things. Um, so anyway. Metal is, there's a lot of interesting improvements though. If you want to debug it um, or do things with it, they've improved the pipeline. And also, maybe kind of interesting, is they have deprecated OpenGL and OpenCL. So. Yeah, that's another thing that's kind of interesting, is they're not. So, um, just for graphics, talking about GPU related things. Um, so OpenGL was sort of like the older standard way. There are a lot of different graphics cards, and OpenGL was the common language that was sort of used to communicate with any one of the different graphics cards. So you could write your code in OpenGL, and it would work you know, across different types of graphics cards. Um, OpenGL had kind of been getting slow, and so Apple was kind of like, well, we want something better for our platform, so they created Metal to do that. Um, so that Metal, they was able to be a lot faster because Apple basically created the GPU um, system that they wanted to use for their products. Um, several years after that, 
another standard that replaces OpenGL called Vulkan was developed that's actually kind of similar to Metal, but it's an open standard, not a purely Apple standard. And uh, Apple has never mentioned or talked about Vulkan in any capacity that I'm aware of. Like, they seem to be completely ignoring the fact that it exists, even though some uh, people, people doing graphics, or especially doing like games or something like that, it's nice to have an open standard. You could write your code in Vulkan and have it work on all the different you know, Windows and Mac and things like that. That's the kind of thing game developers want. They want to write their program, you know, they want to write their game in one language and have it be there. So Apple has never, um, never acknowledged that that is a thing. I think probably one of the reasons is because really game developers are probably using like Unreal or something like that, and so, or Unity or some higher level game engine, and the developers of those engines are taking care of like, okay, we're gonna write Unity for Metal and for Vulkan or whatever. So that's probably the reasoning there, but uh, it is an interesting point they have. Yes? There is one thing. Um, yeah, because I have a few friends who write games and they, they prefer to use their own game engine, so they were a bit upset about this because when you're developing a game targeting Windows and you want to add Mac support, it is actually apparently a non-trivial amount of effort to add well, Metal support in addition to another API. Sure. Um, that being said, one of my friends found a library on GitHub by the Kronos groups, so the guys who actually run the standard, um, called Molten GL and Molten BK, and these are actually like open APIs. One, one, one's paid, one's free, but they let you take an open GL or Molten project, and it will like the API will map all those commands to Metal. So it's like a way to get Metal support for free using the open APIs. Okay, that's interesting. MoltenGL.com. I heard that there was like, a, I thought there was like a commercial thing that was doing that, but maybe there's also an open source one. Vault.gl is commercial, but Vault, Vault VK, which is uh, Vulcan APIs to metal, is open source. Oh, uh, okay. Are they made by the same people? It's the kernel group on, on GitHub, so I think it's the same people. I think it's an official project. Oh, okay, that's interesting. So maybe. There, there are ways around. Maybe there are ways of doing that. Cool. All right. I'm going to move on from metal. And let's talk about another major thing that Apple has been covering, <coughs> machine learning. So is anyone doing machine learning right now? It's a very hot field. It's a very hot field that nobody is actually looking at. We, we just like to talk about how cool it is. We like to talk about how cool it is, but nobody's actually running a machine learning project currently. Um, so machine learning is a really hot thing in technology right now that some of us maybe at some point will have a chance to, to do a project in. Um, so Apple last year introduced Core ML, which was their sort of system for, um, for basically taking a trained model and using that inside of your app. That's the main use case for Core ML. And um, this year they've improved on Core ML in a couple of different areas. One of the things is um, they, so they created a framework called Vision that specifically, it's machine learning, but it's specifically geared towards doing computer vision. And um, it can do better like facial detection and facial landmarks. So apparently if you stick out your tongue, now you can detect that in your, um, in your app if that's something that you want to do. Another thing they thought they did was called people segmentation, which is apparently a fancy way of saying like if you have a photo and there's a person in the photo, it can figure out like where that person is and then you could like cut them out of that photo and put them in like a different background. That's so if you're doing any types of like you know photo filtering or something like that, these might actually be some pretty cool effects that have been added as more of like a high level thing that Apple provides as part of their machine learning uh, tool set. Another thing that they said there's improvements for that they provide are for natural language. So like if you have just some sentences and you want to know what language those sentences are in, um, it can do that and it can tokenize it and determine the parts, which is interesting because I already thought that there were ways of doing that. <laughs> so I don't actually know um, what the difference is. So there was previously like an NS linguistic tiger class that you could use and do some of these things. And now they also introduced this in their natural language API. And I don't know if this is like previously that way of doing it was not machine learning trained. And this one is like, it does the same thing, but was used machine learning to achieve that goal. And maybe it gets different results or better results as a consequence. I haven't actually 
I don't know the difference, but interestingly, they announced that. So if you are doing some you know, type of text processing or natural language processing, you might want to also look at this one. Um, the other one that was cool was, this is new, I'm pretty sure, named object recognition, which means that if you have a sentence like WWDC was in San Jose, it can identify San Jose as a location and tell you that that is a location. Um, so that's just pretty cool. If you want to like get sentences of text and be able to get some type of meaning out of those sentences like locations or names or stuff like that, this framework will, and will allow you to do that. Oh yeah, that's one of the examples of that. And it also, maybe one difference is it works on a lot of languages, not just English, but uh, and Japanese is supported, obviously simplified Chinese. I think some other languages were also supported. So um, that's also kind of cool if you're working on an internationalized projects in different languages, you can do this kind of thing. All right, and finally, um, Core ML2 was announced. Core ML2 is basically um, similar to Core ML, but it allows you to do batch processing, so it's a lot faster. It allows you to, when you train a model, you get this, you know, this collection of data, like your trained model, that could be very, very large in terms of file size. So they have a way of reducing that by a very significant factor. Um, that's what quantization is for. Apparently, it was storing like really long integers or something as as in the model, and now they can like reduce that down to something a lot smaller. Um, and also, it supports more customizable like shapes. I think that means like the shape of the neural network that you use. The neural network is like a kind of graph tree, so you can support more of your own like custom um, custom shapes and models and things. So they've added a lot of improvements if you're doing your own um, training and some framework like TensorFlow or something, you do some training, you get a model, and now there's a lot more support for different types of things, and it should be faster, and it should be small. Um, cool. And then finally, this was cool, um, if you were watching the demo of this that they did, um, they're creating a new tool called CreateML, so if, since nobody here is doing anything machine learning, <laughs> you want to do machine learning, um, they've created this tool that actually works in uh, playgrounds that you can um, very quickly, and when they did it on stage, it was like like seconds, basically, train a train your own model. Um, so it's just this tool that they built, and you, it has a UI, so like you can put a whole bunch of images somewhere and run it, and it'll train it and create a model for you. And that was, uh, quite interesting. So if you are interested in getting into machine learning and want to experiment with it or something, Apple has provided this tool um, that you can use inside any playground. All right. So final analysis on here is there's a lot of um, progress in machine learning. And a lot of that seems to be like, OK, what you were able to do from last year based on like Core ML, now a lot of that can be done with you know, faster, better results, more simply, that type of thing. Any comments or thoughts on machine learning before we move on to the next thing? Uh huh. I feel like Core ML has a big risk of being overshadowed by like TensorFlow for their search for TensorFlow. OK. TensorFlow is already that that could be true. I'm not sure that they're incompatible because I think that Core ML's focus has generally been more on using a trained model. Like Apple isn't at this time isn't really making isn't really marketing Core ML as the way that you would end up with like the training phase of it. They're really more saying like now that you've gotten the result of this training, you're going to be able to use it on on like your mobile device and get better performance and less energy usage and that kind of thing. So they could be compatible with yeah. each other. I, I, mean, think. I guess I understated me create ML. Right? Ah. <laughs> yes, that's possible actually. Um, probably their target is iOS developers and not uh, people doing machine learning. But yeah, that's that's true. So. We'll see. Machine learning is a very fast-moving field, though. 
I do think that tools like this are probably going to be the way that machine learning goes in the long run. Like I think it's just going to be like there's there's now a lot of like UI based machine learning things, and I keep seeing newer ones getting announced where it's just kind of like you know don't worry about the algorithm or anything, just give us some data, and we're going to like shove it into a network and give you back a model, and you don't really think about it that much because the tools just use it. So. Um, that seems to be, I think, an emerging trend. All right. Any other thoughts on machine learning? I don't think the machine learning is a concept. Machine learning is not just one company to do that. I, I think uh, Apple can work with machine learning with uh, many, many people, uh, companies. Mm -hmm. So the machine learning uh, in the OS, iOS, or macOS, they <coughs> do an, uh, like an interface uh, open for uh, many, many companies or people to do that. Uh, because uh, very uh, many, many companies are working with machine learning very very good, I think. Hmm. Yeah, I, I do think that machine learning has also been a very open thing. Like, I mean, everybody who's working in it publishes papers and talks about all the stuff that they've done. So yeah, definitely there's a lot of co cooperation among tech companies in developing it. Cool. Any other thoughts machine learning? One of the big areas of Discussion. Okay, so this one is a brief one, but maybe interesting to some people. They announced a new network framework. It's one of the only like new, kind of interesting new things. So like, um, it's kind of like in Unix. There's something called Berkeley sockets, which are sort of the layer that you do a lot of the networking, and they're introducing an alternative to that. So um, I suppose if you are doing like. If this would be useful if, let's say, that you want to have your app communicate to things across the internet but not using HTTP, <laughs> then that would be the uh, thing. So if you wanted to use UDP or a different protocol because that was <coughs> useful for whatever you happen to want to be doing, this is, um, this is a new framework that they introduced. So anyway, kind of, that was an interesting aside. Anyone? Uh -huh. So what's the name of it? Network. Oh, sorry. It's called the Network Framework. <laughs> so it's new. Yeah, this is new. And I guess it's, uh, as I understand it, it's basically, it's an alternative to using Berkeley sockets, as which is like the really old Unix, like from the early 80s or something, um, like way that you do networking, kind of big standard. So it's interesting that Apple has created a sort of alternative to that, but that's what it is. So maybe interesting if you do networking and if you're like, hey, we don't want to use HTTP, we want to use uh, UDP. Maybe if you're doing IoT or something, that makes a lot of sense. So, all right. Let's talk about some of the other stuff. Don't have that much time, so I might pick up the pace slightly. Mojave, how many people are excited about dark mode? So during this presentation, there was some guy who left a comment that they would like sell their soul to have dark mode in Xcode, which was interesting. So this this has never been a thing that I thought about or cared about until like I heard about it. So is this a thing? Everybody wants dark mode in things? Why? <laughs> why was that important? At night time. Why why should you eyes be bright? okay. It's about night. That makes sense. Cool. Okay, now I understand. <laughs> it's for people who are programming at night and they don't want the background to be white. My Xcode background has been dark anyway, so. <laughs> but now maybe that's the reason. I was like, wow, well, apparently people really wanted this, but I did not even think about it until, like, oh, the entire Mac is dark now. Okay. 
Um, some other stuff that might be cool. Desktops, oh yes, okay, there's a comment on that. So there's actually one more cool thing, I don't know if you guys noticed that. There is a section on the dark mode, and in it, they show how you can change the control accent color, and you can change it to red, blue, green, yellow. And, uh, Rather than black. Uh, so that's it. So I, I thought it was pretty cool. Interesting. Colors. I'll have to see that. So I could make my stream like completely unreadable, maybe. No, 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 no. You can't change it to black, but you oh. can change it away from blue. The accent colors. Like yeah, the, the accent colors. Like the OK ones, the big blue, the big Ah, OK. So oh, just the accent color of that. Yeah. So, so I could change it the same color as the button, as its background, yeah. and not know what the buttons were saying. Not black, right? And yeah, you can't change that. <laughs> There's only like five or six colors you can select. I see. They thought about that. Right. Yeah. Okay. No, I mean, if red, really cool. Ah, like red. Yeah, it's dangerous. Yes, it's dangerous. This changes all your options to do it. All right. Desktop stacks, which are cool if you like organizing your files. And uh, quick actions, which is cool if you're in Finder and you want to uh, uh, add actions to things. Like if you if you have like a PDF object in Finder, you can manipulate that PDF to do things. I thought that was cool and useful, and you can write your own actions. So if you have some thing that you are want to do a lot on your Mac, and you happen to be a developer, then <laughs> you can just build that and do it in Finder. So that's cool. Um, some stuff that affects developers is they're going to start deprecating 32-bit stuff, including QuickTime, Java 1.6, and Carbon L. I don't know what HLTP stands for, but you won't be able to use it anymore. <laughs> um, and also, they emphasize, again, a lot of the security stuff that they're doing. Um, the system integrity protection, that was something they had uh, announced previously. They can protect against code injection in your apps, um, which I guess is an interesting security feature. And there's an app notary service, which is not a review process, but if you're like not distributing through the app store, you can have your app sort of notarized. And the reason why that's interesting is because then they can be more fine if they need to disable an app based on uh, some security issue, they can do it in a more fine-tuned way. That was the reasoning, so, uh-huh. Did they say that the uh, <laughs> SIP was a part of Mojave? Yes, I think it's I think it's changed, but I think for app, for individual apps now, maybe not for the system or something. Uh, okay. It's accessible to apps. Because it's already in in, zero, but... in the operating system, I think, and now it's available to apps. Oh, okay. Was my understanding. Uh huh. Um, it might be that AD Foundation already is the replacement for QuickTime. I think that AV Foundation is basically kind of the successor to QuickTime, so the deprecation of QuickTime might not actually be that big of a deal, maybe. But I don't do anything in QuickTime, so I might be wrong about the impact. How can you record your, your app or your screen if you do I'm not completely positive. I'm not sure that this means they're getting rid of QuickTime the application. I think that they're getting rid of QuickTime can also mean the older like video framework. And I believe that that framework has essentially been sort of not really updated because AD Foundation has become the way that you're supposed to do like video manipulation and it's like the newer framework. But I'm not sure that that relates to the QuickTime app. Me. <laughs> but I'm not actually completely sure that I'm right about that. So, cool. QuickTime 7 is gone now. Uh, QuickTime 7 is gone? That's not so surprising though, because it's been there for years. But it's a shame because it has some features that QuickTime 10 never got. <laughs> All right, other thing relating to Mac OS Mojave. Um, this is that. Perennial question, are they merging? <laughs> Apparently no. <laughs> that seems relatively definitive, but we are going to see UIKit be available for Mac not this year, but next year. 
I also have a suspicion that this might have been why there were so few UI kit announcements or UI innovative things this year might also just be because a lot of the effort right now that they're spending on UI kit is specifically to, they did say kind of at one point that they're trying to rationalize the interface and also sort of the sub layer. So like UI kit is the higher level and then, you know, the, like the core, core foundation, like the AD foundation, like all those things are kind of under it. And they did explicitly say that they're spending a lot of time trying to rationalize those lower level things so that they work both on uh, Mac and iOS together, like the same APIs. Because now, now it's sort of like if you look at a framework like core location, it'll be like, well, there's like 70% the same between Mac and iOS, and then there's like this Mac specific thing and this iOS specific thing. That's true across a lot of those frameworks, and I think Apple's trying to really reconcile them all, so maybe the frameworks are practically the same, so that it'd be very easy to just take an iOS app and move it right directly to the Mac. That was, the, broadly speaking, the, the thing that they seem to be doing. So um, anyway, so they're doing that, and uh, in Mojave, the home stocks news and photos apps are all going to be written in this framework, but developers won't see it for another All right, let's talk about iOS 12. Um, just some features. There are photos, app, new searching, and sharing. They're gonna finally get stocks and voice messages on iPad. Um, there was a really long demo about all the cool things they're doing with the Animoji, Memoji, and FaceTime, and group FaceTime stuff so that you can like turn your face into like an animated animal and then do video chat as that animal with 32 other people. Um, <laughs> that is coming soon, so look forward to that. This is always one of those things where um, a lot of people, I was like, a lot of people that I talked to are kind of complaining about that. But I also feel like one of the things I've heard a lot is right now the Apple iMessage app is becoming extremely popular among teenagers, specifically in the United States not teenagers in other countries, specifically in the United States, and that some of these like sort of Snapchat-esque things are really because of that. They're trying to keep and maintain that audience, and so they spend a lot of attention on it. If you want to know more, read that article. Um, so also, another thing that was a big trend was a discussion about focus and people's attention. So. Um, there's more of like a do not disturb feature to pause your notifications. There's the ability to group notifications and um, that allows you to, uh, you know, from a single app you can kind of get all of those notifications together They just like keep coming one by one. And there's also an activity report so that you can see how you're using your phone. These are um, because there has been a lot of discussion in the past year in the mobile industry about the issue of smartphone addiction for everyone, particularly there's a lot of concern about teenagers, but um, that is something that Apple and Google also, at Google I.O. was responding to. This is one of those industry trends that I wanted to analyze further, but probably don't have too much time. Um, just talk briefly, just ask briefly, like, do you notice that yourself? Do you find that you pick up your iPhone more or that you have this, because I do, confession, in the morning particularly, I can get stuck on my smartphone longer than I want to be. Um, and, you know, is that a feature that you would use? Because I know that I will use that. I will definitely stop myself from accessing certain apps in the morning when this feature comes out. But is that true or does that resonate with anybody else? Yeah, no, it's definitely useful. I mean, I, I'm the same. I'll wake up and I'll check like image and things like that. My like, approach for getting ready for work and stuff like that. So having removing temptation is definitely a good thing to have. Ben had a comment. I think like the notification stuff is more for me because like um, I would always like open random stuff like on like, Instagram if I got a notification about that. So I'm kind of like thinking that that combined with this, depending on which one you like, will overall have a so I don't know if I would use this personally, but like I would definitely use the notifications though. 
Right, like room notification, or do not disturb maybe also could, if, if it's more like you always respond to notifications. Oh, two things? Yeah, sure. Some of it's just usability. Right. Yeah, I agree. Right. I think that would be a big change for which applications you can use. I wanted to say a word about Google because they, in the new version of their, their operating system, uh, they added a feature to trigger the do not disturb mode automatically. It's when you put your phone like this on the table. Uh -huh. Like automatically when you put your phone straight down, you can have like this do not disturb mode, so you won't get any notification in anything. Uh, I thought it was really, really cool. No need to push into the menu or whatever, just like... Yeah, that's actually really cool. I did not know that, but that's a good idea. Yeah. So Point uh, for Google. Shuttle, uh, I did the same thing, but, but not yet. Probably that's going to be rolled into like an update because Apple's going to be like, why did you think of that? <laughs> it's my guess. Yeah, that's really cool. So we don't have enough time to talk about this very deep question, so you can ponder it in the night. What responsibility do, do we as app developers also have regarding issues of smartphone addiction when creating products? I'll just let that haunt your dreams. Um, <laughs> So, um, other exciting stuff, Siri. Um, Siri is going to have more prediction capabilities, so it will try to anticipate stuff, like if you're running late for work, it's going to tell your boss for you. I guess it ask you if it can tell your boss. Google Assistant would tell your boss without asking you, but <laughs> Siri will ask you first. <laughs> um, and the Shortcuts app, which looks really interesting, so there's more ability. It's kind of like they when they acquired Workflow, probably about Two years ago, this seems to be kind of what they were using it for. So you can create your own like feature using the smartphone, and then have the ability to um, to have Siri like do that. So you can set up like one keyword, and that will ca cause a whole bunch of things to trigger. So if uh, for like power user types, I think that's a really interesting thing, and we'll see what that looks like. In, I think it's not on the data. Um, yeah. So now we have HomePod things like that, and also there's like. Siri shortcuts on the watch, so you can interact in more ways. Um, regarding Siri, how do you compare Siri-related features with like some of the other stuff? One of the criticisms that Siri has had over the past couple years is that like Google Assistant or Amazon's Alexa seem to be like moving ahead further. Any thoughts about how um, this relates to what they've been doing and uh, things of that nature? about like an app that you could set up your own yeah, things. I don't know. Is anyone like Android user using? Does Android have some type of uh, thing where you could? I kind of read that it was that Siri shortcuts was like the app was similar to something that already existed on Android, but I don't know enough about that to say that that is the case. That was just like I've never seen an uh, Android person speaking to the Google <laughs> Assistant. You know? Yes. So yeah, that's a good question. I, I thought the shortcuts looked really cool, so it might be unique. But I'm, uh, Android is kind of powerful in some of those areas, so I'm not sure uh, exactly if something similar exists or not. No one else knows, so. But um, it does seem to me as though this is like, the shortcuts is like a, finally Siri can do this, because 
that I've been waiting for that for the, like the past two years at least for like the past two WWDC is the ability to have your app integrate with Siri by having a keyword. So um, it does seem like now Apple is allowing Siri to have some of the same types of flexibility that some of the other voice assistants provided. Um, hopefully that will bring it on par. And then the fact that it also works with the HomePod, I think will bring a lot more value to the HomePod because um, right now, like Amazon Echo is a much cheaper device or the Google, what do you call it, the Google Home, whatever, the Google one. Both of them are a lot cheaper than a HomePod and they have a lot more capability of being able to, you know, get the, in, get, do the thing that you want to do by interacting with the voice assistant. So this is something that I think Apple probably needed to do to kind of keep Siri relevant as a voice platform. Um, so that's good. Not too much time to talk about augmented reality, but that's also one of the coolest things that is there, so I want to make sure that we cover that. Um, relating to augmented reality, one of the things that Apple did is to find a file format that can be used to like share AR content, so that's kind of interesting. And they also had Adobe um, giving a demonstration of an authoring tool that Adobe is working on, but it seems like some of the other like uh, industry, like graphics industry, uh, uh, developers are working on things that also work with this file format. So if you're working in AR and like you want to be able to like share some type of model that you can then like incorporate into an AR environment with other people, that is now doable with this. So it's kind of interesting development. And then uh, some of the other stuff that AR Kit is doing, they've improved the face tracking. So if you're doing like an augmented reality thing and you want to detect somebody's face, like not only like the existence of their face, but now also like where they're looking or the presence or absence of their tongue and things like that. Um, you would have the ability to do that type of thing. Um, the environmental texturing was cool. So it's like, um, it basically creates reflection. So if you draw a 3D object, it uses machine learning to, for example, figure out that there's a light right there and reflect it off of that 3D object for you. So it creates a much greater sense of realism because when you put you know, an object in a 3D environment, it doesn't always look realistic unless it also you know, interacts with the lighting of a room and that type of thing. So that's some of the cool stuff that's there. Um, this demo I thought was also cool, the image detection and tracking. Like, uh, so you could put an object could draw an object on top of a physical thing and then move that physical thing and then the object was able to also move with that. This is all stuff that's, I actually did work in augmented reality back in like 2011 or so and like none of this stuff was possible. So a lot of the, um, a lot of the things that are now kind of capable with ARKit are quite interesting. Um, let's see, the other thing that's, that they're working on are persistent experiences which basically means that you can save AR data and reload it. So like if you have some um, representation in a space, you can serialize that representation and then show it again. I guess that was something that wasn't possible previously. So if you put something there and close the app, it can open it either again. Um, and then also, and this was the cool game that they were, that Tim also mentioned briefly in his talk. There was like a, they showed it like this, the shared experiences are like multiple devices can all share the same AR world. So you could have like different people interacting in the same environment. So all this stuff is really cool, I think. Um, I think the AR kit stuff is some of the most like fun and interesting things that Apple showcased at WWDC. And uh, I think, yeah, a lot of those, uh, I think, yes, they, um, what was I gonna say? That's one of the coolest things. Let's throw that out to the two people and get their impressions. What does anyone else think? Is there anything you want to do with AR? It looks fun. <laughs> uh -huh. it's, it's quite hard to use, you know, using our production code. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. It's only for its private app for fun. Mm -hmm. It's all about like, our culture to be make an idea and then yeah. I mean, very important. Yeah, I think that's one of the biggest challenges they are is, well, and while it's cool, 
it, it's one of those things where people always hit a wall when you're like, so what are you going to use it for? Even though I do think that there are lots of practical applications of it, in fact, um, we still aren't using this. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I've really seen the compelling consumer AR products yet. Among the stuff that I think is really interesting, probably possible and would be good for consumers would be like, I am a tourist in a city, I want to know where the bus station is, hold up my phone, arrow points me that way. Or like I can just look up and like have like annotated landmarks. All that stuff was even possible years ago, actually. The annotated landmark thing was and but nobody's for whatever reason, people aren't using AR in that way. But like that is a lot faster than looking at a map and figuring out where I need to go. I hold up my phone. Oh, that's where I need to go. I feel like the iPhone and like iPad did the wrong device for it. Besides so like you know like natural gaming for like five minutes, it has to be like glasses or something mm -hmm. that's easier to do for extended periods of time. And then bed apples, I think a lot of time is money on this because it's probably working out. Yeah, I think that's also very likely. I think they probably want to launch glasses with what is already like a lot of compelling AR content, and that's probably why they're getting everyone to use it in iPhones and iPads now. Uh, I think that's pretty likely, yeah. Uh, I think if you have an iPhone 10, uh, you can try uh, IKEA app, and there's a way to take uh, items from IKEA and just keep them in your apartment to see how it looks. It's pretty cool. You could do that also to just show an empty apartment and show some stuff inside to show so join your idea. But uh, I was thinking about uh, board games also. I hope some companies will do some, uh, you know, war, Warhammer, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. or Monopoly, whatever. Yeah, I agree. That would, that would be pretty be cool. But I, I didn't see any strong project yet. Uh, uh, I don't have an iPhone yet, so I can't try that. Thing, but I you to try that. Mm. Yeah, actually, I, I thought about board games as well for AR things because it works very well and like, you can see like, like one space and that type of thing. There was a Lego demo also at the WWDC, I think. With, uh, you could see the small character moving and stuff like that. You had a, a real Lego house and you could, you could add virtual objects around the house and move and everything. Yes. Yeah, I saw the demo too. If you watch the keynote, uh, yeah, it was yeah. The keynote, right? Yeah, the, uh, the, the demo that Lego provided was actually quite interesting, all the, just in terms of what the technology was capable of doing. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. I have to move really fast now because it is one. So, Apple Watch. Uh, nine, Okay, walkie-talkie, background audio, we talked about that, interactive notifications. Yeah, this was kind of cool and I'll mention it briefly because this didn't seem to get a lot of coverage, but um, if you want to put MapKit on your website, you can do that, apparently. That's potentially interesting. Um, so it could be a web, like Google Maps competitor, maybe. And this one, if you wanted to play Apple Music songs in your JavaScript project, you can do that as well. Those were two other things that might be <coughs> of interest. And okay, there we go. <laughs> that was my uh, that was the summary. So, um, anyone else? Anything interesting that you want to mention about WWDC or iOS development in general or anything? Objective C got the update. Well, what's it? Actually, I don't know what Objective C got. Objective C got R constructs. It's like, hey. Ah, okay. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. What? R constructs. Yeah. Yeah. You couldn't put objects and structs before, so then you can't. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's simply. Yeah, but the strut is the routine. That's it. Yeah, that's the one. Cool. I missed that. That's. I'll have to go back and write some Objective C now. <laughs> All my stuff That's right. All right. Anyone else? Anything of interest want to mention? WWDC or otherwise related? Oh, 
क्या है 